We're back. We're on. <laughs> Amen. What a blessing. We're continuing in the studies in Genesis and, and enjoying it. And uh, we have been looking at a book in the Bible that that's very much attacked. I mean, this is the, the book that really is foundational because God lays forth the beginnings of his work on this planet, in this universe. And he manifests himself as the creator God. And of course, if, if the uh, skeptics and the critics and the naysayers and the scorners can, can get us to doubt the creator, well, if there's no creator, who needs a savior? Who needs a redeemer? But of course, we're studying this very carefully. And, and as we've gone along, we've looked at scripture first and foremost, because our faith does not stand in the wisdom of men. That's what Paul tells us in Corinthians. But our faith stands according to the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We've been looking at the Scriptures, but we've also taken the time as we've gone along uh, to look at some science, and we have found that all good science lines up with the Bible. And that's been a blessing. Now tonight we come to an interesting chapter. This, this is the most attacked chapter in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. We come to this tonight. Now, we said earlier in our studies of... Uh, a Genesis, that there were four great events that the Lord would lay forth in the book of Genesis. First, creation, and we saw that in chapters 1 and 2. And then the next great event is going to take place right here in Genesis chapter 3. Now, uh, a teacher from many years ago, Dr. Thomas Griffith, quoted that Genesis chapter 3 is the pivot point of the Bible. And the reason he says it is like this, because you know, it's a very important chapter, and the reason he feels it is like this. You look back, and you look at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Now here we see the Creator coming out of eternity. He begins to work. He's a good God. Everything He creates is good. When He's all done, He says it is very good. He makes uh, a creature in His likeness and image, man. And then you see the man in innocence, in a state without sin, in almost a state of perfection. Not quite, but very close to it. Having fellowship with his creator God. Beautiful, beautiful picture. Then if you were to skip Genesis chapter 3, just read 1 and 2, and skip the third chapter and get to the fourth chapter and start reading from 4 on, all of a sudden you would observe envy, anger, lying, deceit, murder, corruption, rebellion, judgment, and you would wonder, what has happened here? Well, this is the chapter that makes it clear. This is the pivot point. This is the one that shows us what happened between that creator who created everything that was very good and put the man there in a state of innocence to what we find in chapters 4 on and in the rest of the Bible. Well, it's all right here in chapter 3. This is the second great event pointed to us in the Bible, the fall, the fall of mankind. It's found in Genesis chapter 3. So why don't we take a look and we'll begin to uh, read in verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 and uh, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig, tree, fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now we'll stop the reading there, and we'll back up for a little bit. Now we remember the setting. God had made the man in his image and in his likeness. And then he saw that the man was alone and it was not good for the man to be alone. And then from the man he took and made a helpmeet, a woman. 
and he placed them both there in the garden. And they were both naked at the end of chapter 2, the man and his wife. And they were not ashamed because the state that they were in, they had perfect fellowship with God. There was no sin between them and the Lord because the Lord turns from sin. It's our sins and iniquities that causes God to turn from us. So here they were. They were in a state where they could have fellowship with God because they were sinless. They were innocent. And now we get to chapter 3 and all of a sudden we find there's another being introduced, the serpent. Now, who is this guy and where did he come from? I don't remember him being mentioned in Genesis 1 or 2. So now what we, need to, we need to go back and we need to get a microscope and we need to look very carefully at Genesis 1 and 2 and see if we can ascertain or figure or reason where this character came from and what he's doing here. Who is this person? Well, going back to Genesis 1 and 2, you won't find him because I've read all the verses and we've read them together. What I do know is that going forward in the Bible and looking at other books, I find out in the last book of the Bible, in, Gen in Revelation chapter 12, that this serpent is the devil. We'll turn there just quickly. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, last book of the Bible, and the ninth verse. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So now we find out this serpent is the devil. This is the one we've all heard about since we were little kids. We've all heard about the devil. Problem is, a lot of us don't believe he exists. One of the reasons we don't believe he exists was just found in the verse we read. He deceiveth the whole world. His greatest art of deception is deceiving us into thinking he doesn't exist. So now the Bible is revealing someone to us that we could not find out about on our own. Because we have eyes of flesh and all we can do is see that which is before us. We cannot see beyond the visible light spectrum. But this serpent, this devil... Right now is something we cannot see. Now, I went back and I started searching and I observed something very curious because I want to find out where did he come from exactly? When was he created? When was he made? Now, I know he's the devil and the Bible tells me in other places a little bit about him. Now, let's go back to Genesis 1, 1 and then I want you to compare Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 2, 1 and I want you to notice a very subtle but interesting distinction. It's, uh, it's so sublime and subtle you would almost read over it. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Notice that. The heaven and the earth. Now turn to Genesis 2, 1 and observe this. Thus, the heavens, plural, and the earth were finished and all the host of them. Now, in our Holy King James Bible, and only in our Holy King James Bible, you will observe that what you have in the first verse is a singular use of heaven, and in the second chapter, first verse, you have it in the plural. Now, I would have expected it to read, thus the heaven and the earth were finished. But it says the heavens, plural, and the earth were finished and all the host of them. All the host of them. The host of the heavens and the earth. Now back in chapter 1, all we read about was the creation of beings upon the earth. The host of the earth. We didn't read anything about a host of heaven. But a host of heaven was created somewhere between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 2-1. And not only that, something occurred between Genesis 1-1 and 2-1 in that the heaven Singular became heavens, plural. Now, remember, the very first verse of Genesis begins with time. In the beginning. Now, the Bible is written decently in order and in order unto us. But it's a progressive revelation. And as we read through it, we're going to learn more and more. Now, going through the Bible, I decided to go through, and I'm not the only one to do this. There are other people that have done it, and gone through and began to look. Although Genesis 1-1 is the first verse from a standpoint of time, 
What would be verses before Genesis 1-1 if you wanted to write the Bible in chronological order? And I began doing that study, and I want to show them to you and what they are, and we can put them on the board. Probably the first verse in the Bible, chronologically, that would literally be before Genesis 1-1 is found in Psalm 90. So we're going to look at the bi chronological order of Scripture. And the first place you would look would be Psalm 90. We'll look at verses 1 and 2. There was something that was before the beginning. What could it be? Time starts with a beginning. It has to start somewhere. This was a problem the chronologists came up with about a hundred years ago when they began studying time. They recognized there had to be a start. Why is that? Because if time, if time as we know it, always went back, and you could always go one second further back, you'd never get to a start, therefore you couldn't get to here. The reality of it is there has to be a start in order to get to a here and now. What is before time? Psalm 90 tells us what's before time. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Verse 1, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, okay, this is before it, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Before time, there was God from everlasting to everlasting. Where was he? Turn to the next big book after Psalms. Now, I know a couple small books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Turn to Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. And when we get there, we'll look at Isaiah chapter 57 and we'll look at verse 15. From everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Before thou hadst formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Now there's God, the only time in the Bible revealing the term eternity. It's only found once in the entire scriptures, right in this verse here. From everlasting to everlasting, God inhabits eternity. So chronologically, from everlasting to everlasting, before time ever began, out there in the reaches of eternity, which kind of short circuits my mind, I don't know about you, but my mind has difficulty comprehending infinity and eternity. I like solid numbers that I can get a handle on, <laughs> but when something keeps going on and on from everlasting to everlasting, the concept of eternity and infinity is a bit much for my mind. But that's what God is revealing in the scriptures there, that, that he is from everlasting to everlasting. He inhabits eternity. As a matter of fact, in the same book of Isaiah, turn back to chapter 43, and he reveals a little bit more to us. In Isaiah chapter 43, the Lord reveals this, verse 13. He says, Yea, before the day was, I am He. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Before the day was, before that first day of creation, the one from everlasting to everlasting, the high and lofty one, the holy one that inhabiteth eternity, before that day was, there he was, the Almighty God, getting ready to do his work. And then from that verse, so that one would say, before the day was, Before the day was, he says, I am he. A constant, ongoing, present tense. Back there, pre past, present, future. 
from everlasting to everlasting, He inhabits it all. Amen. And from this, from these verses, finally, we would come to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning. Here He comes, the high and lofty and holy one, out of eternity, from everlasting to everlasting, before the day was, He comes out of eternity to begin time and to begin His creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He, he starts, kicks off the clock. Time begins. Time zero. And it will now go forward. But God came out of eternity to start the whole thing. And He began creating space, the heaven and the earth. And the beginning, time, he began it all. Space, time, and matter. Rod Serling would love this. Great script. <laughs> this, is a good, this is put forth, what do you say, for your... How do you used to say that thing? Submitted for your approval. Submitted for your approval. <laughs> it's how you would say it. Rod Serling would love this. And this is truth, though. And this is how it comes. I think of a parallel verse to Genesis 1.1 that parallels beautifully with it is John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Mm -hmm. There's the Word. There's, there they come. Here come the Almighty Trinity mm -hmm. coming right out. The Godhead beginning to do their work. Now, what exactly were they doing? Well, it would appear to me, I'm going to try and draw this and, and uh, just to try and help you conceptualize it a little bit as to what it was doing. But we're beginning to see chronologically from Scripture what happened from everlasting to everlasting, <clears throat> eternity before the day was, and here comes the kickoff point, and God starts this thing going forward. Now the way I try and conceptualize it, is that we have God... And he's, he's out there with his kingdom, the kingdom of God. God is light and light dwells with him. And he's inhabiting eternity. And then it tells me in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, and my mind looks at it like this. So, he's inhabiting everything. He fills everything. He fills heaven and earth and all of eternity. And he, he decides to make a creation and he creates an island in the midst of eternity. An island of space, matter, and time. And it's engulfed in his eternity. He is around this entire thing and this island. And the first thing he makes is the heaven. In the beginning, God created the heaven. The heaven is spatial, spiritual. God is a spirit. He leads with the spiritual. He also created, it tells us, the earth. So in the center of this thing somewhere, in the center of this heaven somewhere, he creates the earth. And there's the earth, and I have no idea how to draw, but that's, there's the continent up there, and, and there we are on planet earth. And Now, he hasn't made man yet, but the first thing he creates in Genesis 1-1 is the heaven and the earth. The earth is physical, spiritual, the heaven, spiritual, and the earth. In the beginning, he creates time. And so, in eternity, there's an island of space and time and matter. And that's what he makes. Now, apparently, what's happening here is that God began to make a host of creatures that were angels. That was the first thing that he made. Now, I get this by inference as I read further in the Bible. Let's turn, if you're in Isaiah now, go a few books after Isaiah to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. When we get to Ezekiel chapter 28, we're going to pick it up in verse 11.
Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11. Ezekiel the prophet. God is revealing truth to him. He's speaking through him. And he says in verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now we'll stop for a second. Let's consider the setting. Ezekiel is a prophet. He's speaking to the nation Israel. He's prophesying around the time of the captivity of the nation, which is somewhere around 600 B.C. At that time, the nation Israel had been taken captive by the Babylonians. Ezekiel is one of the prophets out in captivity, preaching to the people who've been taken captive. God's giving him things to speak to his people. And at one point, he tells him, he says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Tyrus was a nation just north of Israel. And Ezekiel is supposed to speak to this king. Now as he's speaking to this king, all of a sudden he says, Thus saith the Lord, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Which has to make you stop and wonder. Because this is 600 B.C. Eden, the garden of God, from what we know of our readings in Genesis 1 and 2 and our studies of chronology, which we've done, is around 4,000 B.C. So if that king of Tyrus had been in Eden, he's a very old man. He's 3,400 years old. And according to our studies in the Scripture, we don't know of anyone that lived longer than Methuselah, 969 years old. So exactly to whom is God speaking? Well, in order to get an idea of that, you have to turn to Matthew chapter 16. You see, you will find sometimes that the Lord, through His Word, speaks to more than one person. It's called the law of double reference, where He's referring to two people at the same time. This happens all the time because, folks, we read the Bible, and although a particular book of the Bible may be written to Moses, God speaking to Moses, you almost feel Him speaking through right to you or to me as we read it. And God's speaking right through to us. God has the ability to refer to more than one person in the book. But here's a particular instance. Watch this. Matthew chapter 16, verse 20. Then charged He, that's Jesus, His disciples, that they should tell no man that He was Jesus the Christ. And from that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So now for the first time he's teaching his disciples, folks, you've been watching me. You know that I, I heal people. You know that God has given me power to work miracles. You know that the common people love the work I'm doing. And I love to do this work for my Father on his behalf. And it looks like a lot of people are following me right now. And it would appear to your eyes that people are going to surround, uh, get around me and ask me to be the next leader of Israel. But what's really going to happen is there's going to be a turn of events and these chief priests and the scribes are going to turn on me and they're going to kill me. And of course, the, the disciples, first time they heard, they just didn't make any sense. Because everywhere they went from village to village, the people loved Jesus. I mean, they just loved him. People loved Jesus Christ. Yeah, there were a few people that didn't like him, mostly religious people. But the ordinary people heard him gladly. The common people heard him gladly, the Bible said. They heard him gladly. They loved him. They said he taught with authority, not as the scribes. The gracious words poured from his lips. That he went about doing good to all and healing and preaching the gospel and setting at liberty them which were bound. The people loved him. The common people loved him. And when he revealed this, they, <laughs> verse 22, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now watch this. But he turned, this is Jesus, and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. He's speaking to Peter, looking at Peter, and yet he's speaking to Satan. He's referring right through Peter to Satan. Why? Because at that moment, who was it that gave Peter the thought that Jesus should avoid the cross? It was Satan. If anyone wants the cross to be avoided, it's Satan. 
Satan wants the cross put out of Jesus' path. He knows that's the cross of salvation. Satan wants to keep the cross from your path because he knows if you stay from the cross of Calvary, that's your salvation mm -hmm. and the one up there on that cross. So it was Satan that filled Peter with that thought and Jesus spoke double reference right through Peter to Satan. That's exactly what's happening back in Ezekiel chapter 28. Go back to Ezekiel 28. The exact same pattern is being manifested in Ezekiel 28. It's the law of double reference. God is telling Ezekiel, you speak to the king of Tyrus, but you know who's inside the king of Tyrus? The devil. That king is full of the devil, and I want to talk with the devil for a minute. Take up this lamentation for him. I got some bad news for him. And so back in Ezekiel chapter 28, we begin to learn something about the devil. What do we learn about him? Verse 12. Take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now we read Genesis 3.1. We saw the serpent was there. There he was in Eden, in the garden of God. He was full of wisdom. He was perfect in beauty at one time. Notice we learn more of him. Verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. So when the Lord made the devil, he was made perfect in beauty. And these were all the precious gemstones that were part of his makeup. Not only that, he tells us this at the end of that particular verse. He says... Um, the workmanship, after the word gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Mm -hmm. Now here's the first thing we get a hold of. God said before, before the day was, I am he. He comes forward and he begins the day and now somewhere after the beginning, this, this creature is made. He is not made before Genesis 1, 1. He is made sometime after the creation. In the day that thou wast created. Before the day was, God was in eternity. This creature is not an eternal creature. Right. This, this one inside the king of Tyrus. Mm -hmm. This devil. This Satan. This serpent. He was made after Genesis 1, 1. Genesis 1, 1. God created the heaven... And the earth, and then I believe, if the rest of the story were told, there'd be more verses right after 1-1 telling us about a cre creation, a creation of creatures, a host of angelic beings that would be created to inhabit the heaven, singular, and the earth. And so I believe what God did here was he began creating this host of heaven. In the day that thou wast created, go back to uh, Ezekiel 28, verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. So again, it was a day that he was created in. And when God created him on that day, when God created him, he was perfect. He was perfect in beauty. He was full of wisdom. He had pipes and tabrets. Those are musical instruments. He was a musical being. He was a cherub. Not just any kind of cherub. He was anointed. That's God putting an anointing or a spirit touch upon him. A filling of the spirit on this particular Cherub. Cherubs are a class of angels. They're a class of angels that are revealed in the Bible that, that stay close to God. They're revealed in Isaiah. They're revealed in Ezekiel. And these cherubs stay around God. They're also revealed in the book of Revelation. And this, was, this devil was one of the anointed cherubs. He was the anointed one that covered. And he was perfect in his ways from the day that thou was created until what? And, and verse 15. Till iniquity was found in thee. Now, as we read through the scriptures, we learn that there are words that God uses to describe sin and rebellion. And the greatest of all is sin. 
And there are two other words that God uses, the words transgression and the words iniquity. And someday when we do a, a study on this in the book of Proverbs, what we will see is that transgression is a type of sin where you actually transgress with your body and commit a sin. And iniquity is an inner sin, the word in, in. It's an inner sin. It's a sin of the spirit. Jesus once said to some people, he said, Thou hast heard, thou shalt not commit adultery. That would be the transgression of actually committing it. But I say unto thee, if thou hast lusted on a woman in thy heart, thou hast committed it already. What he's saying is, you haven't committed the transgression, but the iniquity has already occurred on the inside. And the devil, right here, we learned, had an iniquity in the inside of him. In other words, he was created with a beauty, but on the inside, something went wrong. There was an inner rebellion that took, took place inside of him. It says a little bit more about this in uh, verse uh, 16 and 17. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. So he started with iniquity, now he's moved to full-fledged sin. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the... Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. What has happened to this being, verse 17, his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. Pride was the sin of the devil. It was an inner sin. It began inside the heart and it finally worked its way out. It's the same process that goes on with us. Before we actually commit something, we think of it. Nobody robs a bank by accident. They think about it. They plan it. They plot it in their heart, in their mind, inside, inner sin. And then finally, they may talk about it and then actually go forth and do it and commit the sin and transgress. And it's the same process that was at work here in this being, this devil. Now we learn a little bit more about his fall back in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Who is this guy that comes on the scene? Well, we'll learn a little bit about, uh, more about him. Isaiah chapter 14. And we'll start in verse 12. Verse 12, Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? So we learn his name right here, Lucifer. Lucifer. This is the only time in the Bible, and only in the King James Bible, thank the Lord that he's given us a perfect Bible. Or we wouldn't know this, this creature's name. We only know this from a King James Bible. His name is Lucifer. It's only found once in the entire Bible, right here. Why is that? Because after he falls, he's given a different name, Satan and the devil. And that's found many times throughout the scriptures. And God often does that. When you change spiritual states, you get a name change. Abram goes to Abraham. Uh, Simon goes to Peter. And we find these changes. Jacob goes to Israel. And here, Lucifer drops down to Satan and the devil. And so we find he's fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. He says this, verse 13, why, is, why, why are you fallen? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. His desire was to take God's throne. 
His desire was to take God's throne. So, I believe what happened is, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Something spiritual. Something physical. He starts the clock with time. The days begin. And in the day, He creates the host of heaven. And I don't know how long it was. It may have been one day. It may have been many days. But eventually, one of the hosts, Lucifer, the son of the morning, the anointed cherub that covereth, began to look at himself and said, I'm pretty hot stuff. I'm just as good as that guy on that throne. And he determined that he was going to take from wherever his abode was, and I think they lived on the earth. I think God created this as a place for them to live on. And they lived here, and they had an opportunity to go up every so often and spend time with God. And he said, I'm going to ascend up to the Most High. I'm going to ascend my way up there and get up there. God was still inhabiting eternity. God inhabits eternity. The high and holy one that's lifted up from everlasting to everlasting. And this, this one creature, this angelic being, this cherub, decided I'm going to go up and I'm going to make a rush at heaven and I'm going to take over that throne up there. And I believe when that happened, then the Lord brought judgment. And now we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now we read chapter 1 and verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And what happened was, God did not create a chaos. He created a beautifully ordered system of a heaven and an earth. But when rebellion came in, remember, God has light. And so the light of God was flooding down. It says God will light. There will be no more need for the sun and the moon and the stars someday. And of course, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and His light basked down on His, on his creation. And they basked in His light. And all those beautiful stones on the cherub would glimmer and glisten and gleam in, in a beautiful light from God. And now, when this cherub decides to, to by His lifted up heart to go after God, God says then he brought judgment and there was darkness over this thing. And now God brings darkness upon it. And it says, and there was, uh, the, the, the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Lord covered this thing with a watery grave as he flooded this thing out with the deep. So I believe what we have here is a picture of judgment. Now, I don't want to just jump, is, is this possible? Because, you know, maybe we're wrong on this thing. So let's take a look and understand and see if there are other scriptures that can help us to get this properly. Now, first, turn to Psalm 36. Again, we want to use the words. The words are so perfectly written, line upon line, precept upon precept. Every word of God is pure. We have a pure, perfect, holy Bible in our hands. The Holy King James Bible has every word pure. We notice the difference between Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and Genesis 2.1. Just between going singular to plural started to give us some kind of an insight as to what's happening. And I'll show you what happened. Now, he says, darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, notice what he says right here in, Gen in, in Psalm 36 and verse 6. Now, the, this is a psalm about transgression. Look at the first verse. The transgression of the wicked. Okay? Now, look at verse 6. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep, O Lord. Thy judgments. The deep is a picture of judgment. Genesis 1-2, when that deep is here, that's a picture of judgment, according to Psalm 36 and verse 6. Thy judgments are a great deep. That's not a naturally ordered state. God didn't make it that way. That's how he judged the thing. How do I know? Let's continue. Go to the, uh, the book of Isaiah. Our next big book after the Psalms. A couple books over. Isaiah chapter 45. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then all of a sudden, it's without form and void. Hmm. Without form and void. Is that the way our God works in creation? Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18. Watch this. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself, 
that formed the earth and made it, he established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. When you get to Genesis 1-2, that's not the way he created it. That's a picture of vanity. Without form and void, a deep, a judgment, darkness. That's not how our God works. Something happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Something happened in there. God's not giving us the rest of the story like, what's his name? The guy on the radio? Paul Harvey. He's not giving us the rest of the story here. He's giving us little glimpses of it throughout the Bible, and we're trying to infer it and pull it together. I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to get to find out what happened between 1-1 and 1-2. But he's just giving us a little glimpse of it here. And we're seeing this. As a matter of fact, remember, it was without form and void. Go to the next book, book Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4 and look at verse 23. See, we, we're seeing judgment here. As we just saw in, uh, where were we, Isaiah? 45.18. And now we're taking a look at uh, Jeremiah and we're looking at chapter 4. And uh, the verse I'm really interested in is 23, but I'll give you a running start just so you understand what's going on here. Again, Jeremiah the prophet, he's speaking to his nation and he's telling the nation that they're going to face judgment, that Jerusalem is going to face judgment. Um, let me see. Verse 3. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like a fire and burn that none can quench it because of your, your doings. Declare ye in Judah, he's saying, Jeremiah, go preach, and publish in Jerusalem and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together, and say, assemble yourselves. Let us go into the defense cities. He's, he's telling them, you better watch out because the, I'm going to blow the trumpet. The trumpet meant the alarm. The alarm meant judgment is coming. And so now watch, judgment comes. And he gives Jeremiah a picture of it in his mind's eye. And Jeremiah says in verse 19, my bowels, my bowels. Now, this word has been perverted and corrupted in modern English. But it's a combination of two words, body, wells, the well, the inner well inside the body. The body wells contain the heart and the womb, okay? It's where life springs forth and where hopes and passion and emotions come from. And he's saying inside, from the area where my heart is, where my emotions are, where the life springs forth, he says, I am pain, my bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me, because I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the sound of war. And he's seeing what's going to happen to Jerusalem. God's showing him a picture of the judgment to come. Here it goes, verse 20. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but, but to do good, they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void and the heavens and they had no light. That's a picture of judgment. Those are the same words that you see in Genesis 1-2. Genesis 1-2 is a picture of God bringing judgment upon something and somebody for some reason. That's exactly what you, what's being revealed to us here. And so we see judgment being brought. Now, why is this judgment being brought? The book of Job gives us a little insight to it. Back before the Psalms is the book of Job. Turn back toward the beginning of your Bible and you'll see the big book of Psalms and turn to the book of Job chapter 4. Job chapter 4. And verse 18. Job is speaking about people that serve God. And although God loves people to serve Him, ultimately, 
the righteousness and the holiness and, and everything that comes proper comes from God himself. And he doesn't really put trust in his servants. He says, verse 18, behold, he, God, he puts no trust in his servants and his angels, past tense, he charged with folly. His angels he charged with folly. It appears that when God created the heaven and the earth and he made the host of angels, that one of those angels rebelled and other angels followed with him. And what he did was he charged them with folly and he brought forth the judgment that we read of, that we see in Genesis 1-2. And what happened to them in Jude, the second last book of the Bible, and I believe it's in verse 6 when we get there, Jude, just before Revelation, the book of Jude. Jude's telling us in verse 6, God charged these angels with folly, and here it is in Jude 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, apparently, these angels were meant to live on earth. And they were allowed to come up and worship God maybe once a week. For all I know, they may have a pattern very similar to ours. They had six days where they worked, and one day they came for worship service, and they were allowed to come up into the holy mountain and worship God face to face. They decided to leave their first estate one day when they shouldn't have, maybe in the middle of a work day. They started to cut out of work and go after the throne, and God brought the judgment, and the earth was without form and void, and the deep was upon it, and darkness, and now they were confined into chains of darkness. And then what the Lord began to do is revealed for us in Psalm 104. Psalm 104. Now, this is a great psalm. One, one of the places in the psalm, um, it tells us about his work. Just look in the beginning. I'll show you a few verses. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits. His minister is a flaming fire. In the beginning, God created the heaven, something spiritual. He created a spiritual class of beings and gave them a place to live. And because they were spiritual, they had an opportunity to go up and see God. But when they, when they went at the wrong time with iniquity and rebellion, with Lucifer as their leader, to try and take God's throne, he brought judgment upon them. And now instead of covering them with light, they're covered with darkness. And then the Lord does this in verse 30. Thou, Lord, sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. Now he's talking about the creatures that are being made now. He talks about the young lions. If you went back, verse 21, the young lions. Verse 23, man goeth forth in his work. Uh, verse uh, 25, the great and wide sea, where there are things creeping innumerable. He's talking about the things that are created. Verse 30, thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. And watch this carefully. And thou renewest the face of the earth. Now let's go back to Genesis 1 and I'll show you what I think happened here. And we can only get these notions from the scriptures because I've asked myself over and over as I read through the first two chapters, where did this serpent come from? And it appears he came right in between Genesis 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, right in between those two verses there. But God isn't telling us all right now in chronological order. He will reveal it someday when we're with him. But he's given us little glimpses of it going through the scriptures here. Now, here's what happened. Now, very carefully, observe the markings. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay? And then we're assuming he made a host of angels and they rebelled. Verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, watch it. 
and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Psalm 104, verse 30 said, Thou sendest forth thy Spirit and renews the face of the earth. Now notice, 1 and 2 is a paragraph. And verse 3, you should have a paragraph marking. And now a new paragraph begins in verse 3. Do you have paragraph markings in your Bible? There should be a paragraph marking in verse 3. 1 and 2 are its own paragraph. And now verse 3. And now, here goes the renewing of the face of the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now the next six day period we're about to read about is the renewal of the face of the earth. God is going to renew this thing for a new creature. That's us, folks. Why? Because I believe that the, the purpose of the host of heaven, the angelic being, was to worship God. And I believe one of the reasons Lucifer had all those pipes and tabrets was he led the worship chorus. That was his job. And angels would sing and he would play and, and it was just beautiful music worshiping God. And when he rebelled, God said, okay, put him aside, I'll make a new creature. In my image and likeness, a little bit different in nature. This creature has the ability to die. Those creatures don't. Jesus said in the, in the uh, regeneration, in the world to come, we shall be like the angels in that we do not die. Right. We have the ability to die. The angels can't die. Mm -hmm. And so what the Lord had to do is then put them aside somewhere and renew the face of the earth in six days so that there was a place for us to live on. Mm -hmm. But they're still out there creeping around. Now here's what God had to do. Watch what he had to do. At one point, verse 6. So God brings his light back, the first thing he does on day one. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, here's what he had to do. This whole thing was flooded out with water. The entire thing was, was flooded out with water here. And so what he needed to do was he needed to lift up the waters. And so he begins a recreating, a renewal project. And what he does is he opens up a space in here. And he, he separates the waters from the waters. And he brings up a host. And he brings waters up high. And now the universe is surrounded way up high, far away, with a deep layer of water that's high in the heavens. He lifted this thing up. And he separated that thing. And so there's a layer of water. Now, I get this from the scriptures. Let me take you to show you some scriptures so you don't think I'm making this up. Uh, the first place we want to look is uh, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 13. I'll show you some scriptures. Jeremiah and Job is where we'll be going. Jeremiah 10, 13. How are we doing on time, Joe? Uh, about six minutes. All right, we'll finish up with this. Now, he's talking again about a creation. And in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 12, it tells us that God, he made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom. He hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. There's a multitude of waters up there in the heavens. Way up high. He had to lift this thing up. To separate the water high up. Now, Job gives you an even better picture of it. Turn back to the book of Job, chapter 40. Uh, make that Job, chapter 37, be the first one. We'll get the first reference there. All right, Job 37 and verse 18. This is God speaking. Uh, this is actually, no, actually God speaks in the next chapter. This, this particular chapter is Elihu speaking and he's asking questions about God and God's going to give answers in the next chapter. But here's one of the questions he asked to Job. Hast thou with him, he's Job, did you, with God, did you spread out the sky which is strong and as a molten looking glass? And then God says this in the next chapter, chapter 38, verse 30. The waters are hid as with a stone, 
and the face of the deep is frozen. So the sky is stretched out like a molten looking glass and the waters like a molten looking glass frozen. And so God sits up here on his throne above all this water. That's why when you look up, the sky is blue because there's water up there. The deep has been moved and pulled back. Now, what else did God have to do? When he made the separation of the firmament, go back to Genesis 1. Here's what he had to do. He had to make a separation in the heaven. He made this separation, and the separation is in verse 8. For those of you who want to check one time, I have one other reference written. It's Psalm 148 and uh, verse... I just got it in my book here and I just wanted to make sure I got it to you. Verse 4, and that says, uh, Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Waters above the heavens. Mm -hmm. Now here's the thing. Verse 8, And God called the firmament heaven, the evening and the morning were the first day. Now here's what He had to do. He had to make a heaven... The second heaven confined to darkness. And that's the one you can look out right now at night and see. This heaven up here is completely dark. Out there in outer space, the closed firmament of heaven, out there it's completely dark. What's out there? Those angelic beings confined to darkness until the day of judgment. The other heaven that circles the earth is half dark and half light. On the night side, it's dark. And on the day side, it is light. And now, God had to go from making the heaven, singular heaven, and the earth, to having two heavens. And in the renewal process of days one through six, he had to spread out and make two heavens, which is why when you get to chapter two and verse one, look, notice what it says. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished. That's not how he made it originally, but after the rebellion and the judgment, and the renewal of the face of the earth, now you got two heavens that are finished. Only in a King James Bible. Now, most scholars, biblical scholars who don't believe the book and rewrite it, help God out, and the majority of your new Bibles will have heavens in, in chapter 1 and verse 1. God created the heavens and the earth, but He didn't. He created the heavens, singular, and the earth. And then after all this stuff got messed up, now there's two heavens underneath the face of the deep. There was only one because God had that thing nestled into him real close so that he could have close communication with his created beings. But now that there's sin, there's a separation of God with this big layer of darkness. So that's where that serpent came from. And when that thing was, when the earth was being renewed over that six day period and man was finally placed there, there was a very dangerous being floating around looking for an opportunity to make his move which we'll read about next week in Genesis 3. Any questions? Let's thank the Lord. Father, we do thank you for the perfect Bible that we have. If it weren't for this word, where every word is pure, we couldn't know these things. Help us to understand these things. Thank you that you love us and you've given light into our hearts and that even though there's a devil out there to deceive us, Lord, greater are you that's in us than he that's in the world. We thank you. Help us this week to go forth as Christians by your power, by your spirit and your might. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. How was that? That was awesome. I was praying. I said, Lord, help me get this across because I got it in my mind. Now that I can...